This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Why Is Everyone Yelling? With Lindsay Hine, I am your host, Lindsay, and I'm so grateful that you're joining me today. Parenting is really hard, and my hope is that with this podcast, we can grow together and have a community where we all feel supported. Make sure you join our Facebook group, Why Is Everyone Yelling?, and follow us on Instagram so you can connect with me and everyone else following along over there. Today, you're listening to episode five, and I'm talking with Andrea Thorpe. Andrea is the mother of three girls and she homeschools them. She is also the founder of the African American Homeschool Moms and she's a writer. She actually designed a special resource that is a book and it's a journal for both parent and child and a way for them to connect with one another. In this conversation, I felt like I was talking to someone who was a true life and mom mentor. I gained a lot of perspective and knowledge from Andrea. I felt comfortable with Andrea. I felt like I could be sitting on her couch with a cup of coffee. It was a conversation that really warmed me up. It warmed my soul up and it warmed my mom heart up. I value this conversation with Andrea so much, and she is a mom that I really look up to. I hope you get as much out of this conversation with Andrea as I did, and make sure you find Andrea on social media and let her know how this conversation spoke to you. Her Instagram is andrea.thorpe, T-H-O-R-P-E. Okay, if you love this conversation or any of our conversations we've had here on this podcast, please consider leaving us a rating interview on whatever app you're listening on. That is a huge help in new listeners finding the show. And so we just appreciate that so very much. All right, friends, enjoy my conversation with Andrea Thorpe. Well, today on the podcast, I'm so excited to welcome Andrea Thorpe to the show. Welcome to the podcast, Andrea. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. How's your day going? Pretty good. Where I am, we're in New Jersey, and the weather is is nice. We're in that in between summer and transition to fall season, so we can have windows open, um, fresh air blowing in. So it's it's good here. Oh, that's nice. That's we're we're in Indiana, and that's the same here. But I am so weird. I'm so obsessed with quiet when I sleep that I can't sleep with my windows open, and my husband it drives him crazy. <laughs> You can't be married unless, you know, you want one thing and your <laughs> husband has another taste, right? That's like the the temperature, the thermostat wars that we have here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know. Oh, man. Because I, I always want it warm in the winter and I want it cool. I want it like 70 in the summer and he is always cranking it up to like 75. Yeah. Such is life. <laughs> yes. Well, tell us a little bit about your family. You have three daughters. I do. I have been married to my husband, JT, for the past 18 years, and we have three girls. My oldest is about to be 16. Her birthday is right around the corner. Uh, she is a high school junior. And then my middle daughter uh, is 14. She's a freshman. And my youngest daughter just turned nine, and she is in fourth grade. Okay. Well, we can get some tips from you for parenting teens because my oldest is eight. And so I don't know that f yet for these interviews that I've talked to moms of teens yet. So I'll have to pick your brain about that. You know, it's interesting when I remember being in that place where I did not have a teenager and I remember just being scared thinking, okay, I'm, I'm okay at this parenting thing now, but you know, you always hear scary things about teenagers. And I can honestly say with 100% certainty, my teenagers are just a joy. I mean, mm. they're good kids. I enjoy talking to them. So don't be, don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. It's, you know, what you put into them now is important so that as they get older, they'll know, but I am having a good time parenting teenagers. You know what? Was it your post? I think it might have been one of your Instagram posts where you, and correct me if I'm wrong, I read this somewhere where somebody was saying um, 
like don't listen to everybody if they're saying you know all all teenagers have these bad attitudes because it doesn't it's not always like that it doesn't have to be like that Yes, ma'am. That was my post. My daughter and I were at my nephew's birthday party. Okay. And you know, you know how you have one of those good hair days? Yes. <laughs> you say, Let's take a picture. Let's take a picture. So that's what we did that day. And I just remember later in that evening when I was going back and just, you know, looking through the pictures from his birthday party, that picture just struck me because it was just, you know, it was a nice moment. And I truly, truly enjoy, I enjoy being a mom, but I enjoy, um, that time of parenting teenagers too. It's a, it's a different time. And I don't, I don't want anyone to think that it does not come without its challenges, nor do I want anyone to think my teenagers are perfect because they're not, but um, it's, it's a good time. It's, it's a great time to uh, create strong relationships with your kids. And just to be able to look back and see that all the work and all the things that you poured into them when they were littles, they make a difference as they grow and our kids don't forget about them. Yeah, I was thinking that, as you mentioned, you want, what you're putting into them now is going to affect, you know, how those relationships are and how they act um, when they're teenagers. What are some of the things, I mean, I, this is such a broad question, but like, what are the, some of the things you think are of most value now looking back that you cultivated when they were younger? I think the biggest thing for me has just been taking time to listen to them. And when I say listen to them, I mean the big things that they have to tell you, but the small things are important too. You know, sometimes our children come to us and they they want to share some little things with us. And in our minds, we might be thinking, well, that's not so much of a big deal, but to a child, it is. Mm -hmm. And when you take the time to listen to them when they're small, when they're five, six, seven, eight, and they know that as they get older, they know that you can talk you can talk to them and they'll listen to you because you spent that time working on that when they were small so i always try to make sure that when my kids are talking to me i really do stop what i'm doing and give them my full attention and there are times that i may be in the middle of something and i can't and when those times happen i say hey i want to be able to listen to everything that you have to say give me five, 10 minutes to finish this up. And then I'm going to come down and sit with you so I can really hear what it is that you have to say. But just that listening is so important because if I tell my husband, if we don't listen to them, when they tell us the little things, they're not going to want to tell us the big things. So to me, listening is just such an important thing when you're parenting children. Okay. I wasn't even going to go here, but now I'm like, I have all these questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the the thing that I, uh, you know, we're kind of entering in right now is when your child does something that they should maybe shouldn't have done and you're throwing them the lines that are like, hey, listen, you need to tell me the truth and be honest with you, with me, no matter what, what you did, like, I'm always going to love you, um, but you're always going to be in there's going to be less of a consequence if you actually tell me the truth. Like you could always come to me and you can always tell me the truth because um, it's, it's that point where, you know, kids think that they need to say they lie about something because they're scared of what the consequences will be. Mm -hmm. um, how did you walk through those challenges? And, and I'm sure you still do. We do. I mean, I, I tell my children all the time. And my if I were to call my nine year old in here right now, she would be able to tell you. I tell them time and time again, when you choose the behavior, you always choose the consequences. Um, and they understand that. They know that every choice they make comes with a consequence. Sometimes the consequence is good. Sometimes the consequence is not so good. And then the other thing I do is I give them time. You know, I say, okay, it looks like we need to have a conversation about this. Is now a good time for us to talk about it? Because we we do need to talk about it. We're, we are going to talk about it. I'm going to give you the choice of whether or not you want to talk about it now or do you want to talk about it, you know, before you go to bed. But either way, we're going to have to talk about it. And in that space, sometimes I find that it gives my kids time to kind of get their thoughts together think about what it is they need to say, think about how it is that they want to approach me. And like I said, again, if, if we've spent time walking them through their mistakes 
and listening to them, it makes those times so much easier. But that's how that's how we approach it here. I love that you give them the option to talk about it now or talk about it later. And I think that's one thing I'm learning as I go. You know, we're always learning and rethinking and, and relearning things. But is that uh, for a long time, I wanted that instant gratification. Like, okay, we are going to address this situation right now. And we are going to fix what happened right now. Mm -hmm. And what I'm learning is that, yes, the conversations do need to happen. But if you, as the parent, expect them to happen immediately, um, that can throw you off, too, because you have emotions involved as well. Oh, this is this is definitely true. There are times where my children have done some things and I've been upset. You know, I've been angry or on the flip side of that, my feelings have been hurt. You know, mothering makes you very vulnerable and your kids say things sometimes that hurt your feelings. And sometimes it's, you know, intentional that they'll say it in the moment, but there are other times that they'll inadvertently hurt your feelings. And that, that time of giving them space also is good for me too, because it allows me to get my thoughts together and gives me time to say, okay, I, this is a 14 year old I'm dealing with. She doesn't really mean this. She's saying this right now in the heat of the moment. I need to recognize that. She doesn't mean what she said. It's good for us to wait till we can both calm down, get our emotions all straightened out, and then we can come back together and do it. So waiting, waiting for us is a good thing. Oh, that is so good. I love (laughs) it. Well, I would love for you to share with us a little bit about what you do with the African-American homeschool moms community. Sure. So my husband and I have been homeschooling our children since 2008. So um, my oldest went to preschool for one year when she was three. And then after that, um, we decided that we would we would homeschool. And once she got to be of school age, kindergarten age, I was looking for materials and resources that were more culturally aware, that had people of color in them. Um, information that was really accurate to what has happened throughout history. And I wasn't finding that in many of the homeschool places online that I had visited. And so I said, I'm sure there are other moms of color who are out there looking for resources and materials like I am. And it would be kind of neat if we were all in one place so that we could share information and talk about things and encourage one another. And so this was back in 2014 um, and Facebook, you know, was was pretty big and grouping and groups on Facebook were big. And so I started the group and there were initially about 20 moms there. And then it was one of those things where word just kind of spread. And now six years later or so, we have about 25 hundred women in the group. So it's a, it's a good place for um, women to be able to encourage one another to find resources and just to share the homeschool journey because in, in homeschooling, like in, in mothering, it's, it's good not to journey by yourself. It's good when you have other people going along with you. Yeah, that's so awesome. What that's two point. Yeah. I looked at your group today is 2.7 thousand members. That's awesome. Thank you. Do you have hope that more culturally diverse education will start happening in light of what 2020 has brought out? I I think it's already started to happen. And I can tell just because of the emails that I get. Um, I would get emails in the past because African-American Homeschool Moms is the Facebook group, but there is also the website that accompanies it. And I'm starting to get a lot more inquiries there, just not from people of color. I mean, I've had I've had people say to me, hi, um, I'm not a mom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm I'm not um, homeschooling my kids. Um, But do you have any resources that you can recommend? So I think it's I think it's already starting to happen. I think and I'm feeling hopeful. Yeah, I was watching uh, my son. We're doing virtual school here. Um, We're going back in two weeks. I'm pretty excited about that. (laughs) 
Um, but I was watching my kindergarten, my kindergartner's um, art lesson, and I noticed that they were talking about more culturally diverse pieces than I have noticed in the past. Now, maybe that's because I haven't been in the classroom with them and I don't see everything they're doing, but I felt like what they were learning it seemed like there was a lot of intention behind it, and mm-hmm. I felt really good about that. Yes, I'm seeing similarly. Yeah. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about being a homeschool mom. And I think that my biggest thought, um, and, and, you know, a lot of parents listening have been doing this crisis homeschooling, right? Where we're Mm -hmm. virtually and, um, we are not following any sort of homeschool curriculum. We're doing what the school system tells us. And it's, you know, I know any homeschooling mom will say, that's not homeschooling, just so you know. (laughs) But my question is, how do you, like, separate school mode from mom and other life mode when you're doing it all in the home? It's interesting because I always see myself as a mother first, And I think part of that is because we have always homeschooled. So like I said, my oldest did preschool for one year when she was three, but that's the only time that she's had um, a traditional educational experience. And the other two have, have only known schooling with me. So for me, homeschooling is just another part of my maternal responsibilities, kind of like cooking is Mm -hmm. and laundry is. So it, it all folds, it all folds together. It's just part of our day and it's part of what we do. I was a public school teacher for nine years though, before I um, had kids. And so the one issue that I ran into was just trying to recreate school, Mm. the official school experience at my house. And I soon learned that that, you know, that didn't work because we needed, we homeschooled because we wanted to give the girls a personalized education and do those things that would meet their specific needs. Now, we school during the daytime, you know, regular daytime. So depending on the day, we'll start around nine o'clock. And generally speaking, we'll finish up by four o'clock or so. And my kids are like the traditional school kids. And I have no child clamoring here saying, hey, mom, it's six o'clock. Let's do math. You know, when, <laughs> when, <laughs> when the school day is done, my kids are, are done. And occasionally we'll do stuff on the weekends. But the good thing about that is if something has to happen on the weekends, say a science experiment or something like that, my husband is the one who will take care of that. But the issue with me is not so much turning it off during the school day, because that's what that's what our routine is. It's after the school day is done. And in the evening time, I'm thinking, OK, I need to do these lesson plans. OK, oh, this would be a great project for the kids to do or, oh, this museum just opened and my mind is going in 50 million places and there's a ton of stuff I need to do. What works for me is I I use my calendar and it is truly my personal assistant. I am a color coded person. Mm. Every person in my household has a different color in my calendar. So at a glance, when I see orange, I know that has to do with homeschooling. If I see green, I know it's a church event and every person has a color. But what I do on the weekends is I sit down and I do some time blocking. So I'll think about all the things I need to do for schooling. So I'll say, okay, I need to read ahead in these chapters. I need to watch this video. And so I go to my calendar and I will block out an hour and a half. And this is my homeschool time to work on math. And that's all I do for that hour and a half when that time comes. And when that hour and a half is done, I close up my materials and I move on to whatever else it is that I want to do or need to do. Because if I don't do it that way, then I'm con- there's constantly something to yes. do. You know, that's 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 how it is. But for me, I have had to learn how to compartmentalize because if not, schooling will overtake everything that I'm doing. So time blocking for me is critical. That is such a good point. I've been trying. I'm not the most organized person. Um, but say for interview prep, for instance, I like you mentioned with um with, you know, prepping for the math lesson or whatever, if you just do little bits and then you, and then you put it down and then you come back and then you put it down, it's never going to get wrapped up. And I've been trying to say, okay, for these 30 minutes, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not answering texts. I am researching for this interview. And if I can get like a 30 minute block in, 
I'm I'm so much better prepared than if I haphazardly prepared for an hour and a half, say, with that 30 minutes. So you have to do you have to do what works for you. And that's the beauty of just scheduling. Yeah. You know, the way I schedule, I have my older two. I have a junior <clears throat> and I have a freshman. And my 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 older daughter, who is a junior, when she does her planning and scheduling, she sits down. She has this notebook and it's really weird. It's like the size of a coaster. Oh, it's my. Tiny. And but she her whole entire educational process is in that little notebook. I would not be able to work like that. It would drive me crazy, (laughs) but it works for her. Like I never have to say, hey, did you do this? Or hey, did you do that? She always takes care of it. My middle daughter, who is a freshman, she likes digital planning. And so everything for her has to be done inside of that digital planner. It has to be written down in the calendar. She likes bleeps and buzzes and alerts and all that. So whatever method it is that works for any parent, that's what you need to do. And that's that's the good thing about parenting. I do what works for my kids and you do what works for your kids. You do what works for your schedule. And then I do what works for mine. But whatever the case may be, it's just to me, it's just important to have some type of organization when you do it. Do you, what calendar system do you use? Is it just your Google calendar? Yes, ma'am. I use my Google calendar and everything is color coded. And then I use Google tasks to go along with that. And I use Google keep (laughs) to go along with it. Um, And since I'm teaching, I have Google Classroom, too, because I'm teaching some children from our homeschool group as well. uh So I keep it's just easier for me to keep everything in Google. And I one of the things I love, I just discovered this maybe six months ago, is that I can set it up so that every morning Google sends me an email with my agenda in it. So when I wake up at 630, quarter to seven and I'm getting my day started, I can go straight to my email and God bless Google. It has listed every single thing that I've put in my calendar for the day. So I know what I need to do. Wow. I don't have that function checked or whatever box I need to check to make them do that. Go see about it. It's a game changer. (laughs) That is awesome. It's like having a secretary almost. Almost. Not quite. (laughs) Yeah. Google, the Google virtual assistant. Well, I... I am one of those people that will buy 12 calendars and I still can't figure out what's best. And, <laughs> and I want, I, I'm like, I feel like I need to visualize it. Like I need a massive wall where everything's in front of me out that like that. But I also want it in my phone. So here I am at 37, still trying to figure out what calendar system is best for my life. They, we need a support group for something like that, don't we? We yes. just need like calendar junkies or or somebody to come in and just help us rein all these calendars in. But there's because it, there's so many choices. And to me, that's what makes it difficult, too. You know, if I ask my kids, you know, what do you want for dessert? Do you want chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? There's not a whole bunch of, you know, it's either or. But when you're dealing with 50 million different calendars and every choice looks good, it, it makes it hard. I understand. You know, speaking of of choices when you mentioned your kids and the ice cream my aunt everybody listening she gave me the best parenting advice one time I don't remember how many kids I had at that point but everybody was fighting about where they're going to sit in the car and whose car they were going to ride in I think there were some cousins involved too and my aunt just like calmly without like overstepping because I could tell she probably didn't want to like um overstep my parenting but she said I'm just going to tell you what I'm seeing right now. I'm just seeing that there are probably a, too many choices for them. Mm-hmm. And if you could eliminate some of those choices, I think that would help this chaos. And I have thought about that every step of the way since she told me that. Because when kids have 900 options and there's multiple kids involved, nobody's going to agree. Right. <laughs> That's good advice. That was great advice. Yes, that was my Aunt Julie. Thank you, Aunt Julie. Another calendar comment, though, and then we'll move on from calendars. I bought (laughs) this, like, big, beautiful calendar from Lindsay's Letters, and I put it on a wall that I thought was going to turn into my office once one of our kids moved out of that room, like, you know, out of his crib. And I haven't touched it. I got it last year and it is still on that wall in that room that that kid is sleeping in. So um, 
you know, it's not the most decorative, uh, friendly room for a, a baby. And also there's a big giant calendar that costs way too much money. That's not being used sitting in there. So I know I'm, I'm well familiar with that. I'm well familiar with calendars and things that you buy that don't get used. So I know. Oh my goodness. Okay. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about was your, is the journal that you made. And I love the idea behind slowing down and connecting with your kids. And I think that you use this journal to um, facilitate that. So can you share about that a little bit? So when my oldest was, I want to say she was probably about nine. We, I I went to the Dollar Tree and got one of those standard composition books, you know, the, the black and white marbled ones. And I just started just writing notes to her in it. And it, it, you know, one note might say, hey, you did a really good job on your math lesson today. Mom is proud of you. And I would, I left it in her room and I said, I just want you to write a note back to me. And she did. And then she put the journal with the note, her response right next to my bedside. And we just started going back and forth that way. So sometimes I would, sometimes I would just write silly things like a knock, knock joke. And I would, you know, put it in her room. And the next day I would get the journal back and she would say, mom, your jokes are lame, but here's a knock, knock joke. And she would leave me one too. But what started to happen was in the writing of that back and forth journal, I would just start to leave her other type of notes and just say, you know, I was thinking of you today and I was remembering the time when you did this. I'm so proud of the, the, you know, the, the, the young lady that you're becoming. And she would write a note back to me. And at first they were kind of, surface type of things. But after several months, we got a little bit deeper. And then I would say to her, you know, I could tell that you were struggling with such and such today. I appreciate the way you handled that. That's showing some great maturity. I'm proud of you. And she would write a note back and just, you know, talk a little bit about it. And then I would say, well, is there anything you you need to tell me? Is there anything you want me to pray for you about? And she would write down her prayer request and just share things that were on her mind. And after a while, it, it was wonderful because you you have that that composition book and it's just, it's a memento. You know what I mean? It's one of those mm-hmm. things where if the house were on fire and you could only grab a few things, you know, that would be one of the things that I would want, I would want to grab. And so after a while I thought, hmm, this, if this is blessing me, you know, it might bless somebody else. So I put the journal together and it has now the journal that I've created is a is a Bible based one because that's you know, that's how we are. But it has different sections just about education and food and corresponding stories that go along with it. But then there's a series of matching questions for each one of us to answer. So maybe in the um, education section, there's a question that says, um, what do you want to be? What what did you want to be when you grow up? And so I would answer that mm. question. But the child can answer it, too. And you can kind of go back and forth together, looking at the same section, answering the same exact questions, but pulling different things from it because parent is coming from the parent perspective, but your child is coming from that kid perspective that's different. That is so cool. I love that idea. <laughs> I um I set up email accounts for my kids a long time ago, and I, I've not great at remembering to, you know, I, I just sent my second an email the other day. I thought, oh, he was making me, I was so proud of him for something. I thought, Lindsay, send him that email. That's why you set up those accounts so that, you know, whenever they start checking their email, they can, they can see these notes. But I love the idea of physically writing it out. And also I feel like as your kids get older, it probably um, humanizes mom a little bit, you know, like you think mm-hmm. of mom as like, Oh, she's my mom. That's who she is. But it kind of puts more of a personality and like she's more than just my mom into those messages. Yeah, because there's the there's the mom that they know from the time that they're born until now. But then there's the woman that you were before you had those kids. You know, there's the there are the things I used to be able to do or, you know, had the money to do or the time to do before I became a mom. And those are the kind of cool stories that you want to be able to, you know, share with your kids. I, I There's one section in there and it, I talk about how when I was young, 
maybe 10 or so, I just had this this vision of what my life was going to be like. I was going to, you know, live in this big, huge castle and I was going to have twins and I knew exactly what their names were going to be. Um, but that's not that's not how my life has turned out, which is fine. But it's interesting when my kids look back and say, are you serious, mom? You actually had dreams and daydreams, mm-hmm. silly things like that. Yeah, mom did. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's interesting to see the look on your kids' eyes when they see a picture of you from when you were little or when you (laughs) share something like that. They're like, oh, hmm. Like I I can see, as especially as my older kids, my oldest is eight, I can see him processing that a little bit, like pondering, oh, that (laughs) was mom before me. And, you know, I've thought about this a lot. My husband's mom, so my mother-in-law, passed away like three years ago, and when she died, one of the things that stuck out to me so much that he just kept reiterating in his, in his mind and talking to me about was that he more than ever before he thought of his mom as a a person outside of being his mom. He he would picture her at parties with her friends and and at concerts with with my father in law and all the things that she was outside of being a mom. Mm-hmm. And so many times we, we, even now, you know, me with my own mom, I, you know, she's my mom. I go, I, who do I call when I have a question? I call my mom because right. mom has the answers and, um, uh, gosh, as you age, you kind of just see it as a big picture so much more. And it's, it's cool to think of our kids thinking of us that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So true. It, it's, it's interesting too, because they I, what I'm seeing with my kids is then that encourages them to kind of be forward thinking and saying, you know what, there there's a good possibility that I could be a parent one day. What are my kids going to say about me? These kind of things that are happening right now with mom um, in our household. These are the kind of stories and the kind of interesting things I'm going to tell my kids later on. So it helps them see the big picture, like you mentioned. Hey, everyone, a quick break here to let you all know that this is a podcast that is part of the Sandy Boy Productions Network. And along with this show, we have two running podcasts, podcasts where runners are interviewed and the news in the running industry is shared. I'll have another with Lindsay Hine. That's me. That's my other podcast and the Up and Running podcast with Lauren and Abby. They share you all the latest news in elite and professional distance running. They also have some interview based episodes as well. And then the Illuminate podcast where myself, along with a couple other co-hosts, talk with social entrepreneurs, people working at nonprofits, people who have deep passions for helping others in the world, and we share their stories over there. If you love this podcast or any of those podcasts, please consider leaving us a rating and review and sharing about the episode you enjoyed on your social media so that new listeners can find us. We would appreciate that. You can connect with me personally on Instagram. My Instagram is lindsayhine626. And don't forget, we have an Instagram for this podcast, Why Is Everyone Yelling, as well as a Facebook group. And we would love to connect with you there. All right, friends, enjoy the rest of my conversation with Andrea Thorpe. Let's talk about some ways we can slow down and connect with our kids. I love the journal thing. I mean, if that, if nothing else, like (laughs) go buy a composition notebook or go buy the journal that Andrea made today and just send a note to your kid today. Yes. I love, but I love your idea about, um, the emails. Now I set up email addresses for my kids several years ago and now I don't feel like a weirdo. I'm glad I'm going to be able to tell a few people (laughs) that I talked to somebody else who set up email addresses for their kids well before their children were able to use them. Because I remember telling people I did that and they said, well, why, why do they need them? And at the time I said, I don't know. I just feel like it's the right thing to do. I, I, I just feel like they need an address, even if they're not using it. But I love your idea of being able to send them those emails. I'm going to do that. I have one. Oh, my youngest has not used her email address, but I am. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to write down once a month. I'm going to send an email to that that sweet little girl and let her know that I love her and what I'm thinking about her. Oh, I love but, it. Um, a few things that I, I thought of as far as um, just slowing down. I I like to say with my kids, for us, sometimes we need to do more than slow down. Sometimes we need to pump on the brakes and just stop, Mm. you know, and just really enjoy 
the time that we have with our kids because I look at my oldest and she's about to be 16. And Lindsay, I'm telling you, mm. I don't I don't know what happened to the last 16 years. Like some days I feel like weren't we just pulling the van into the into the garage and taking an, an infant out of the car seat thinking, what do we do now? And now she's, you know, she's almost an adult. So if we stop and just really listen, like I said, actively to the things that I, our kids have to say, that that is a that is crucial, I think. But the other thing I like to do, much to my children's chagrin sometimes, is <laughs> I ask a whole bunch of questions. I ask questions all the time because I want to know what they think about things. And it's not just, you know, what did you think about um, the activity that we did today? I ask them questions about all kinds of stuff. You know, I now that they're older, I ask them questions about current events. You know, what do you think about what happened here? You know, what do you think about the way this person was treated? What do you think about this person's response to the situation? If you were in that situation, what would you have done? And then I ask, you know, other questions, you know, about their goals. And as they get, as they age, their goals and their their aspirations change. And so when I hear something different, I'm asking a question. That's kind of interesting because I remember a couple months ago, you said you wanted to do X. Why, why has that changed all of a sudden? So to me, asking questions is a good thing. And, and I'm not talking about just, you know, setting aside every evening at six o'clock mm-hmm. is going to be question asking time. <laughs> My kids know at any point in time, you just need to be prepared because I could have a question. Anything that pops inside of my head, I'm like, you know, we'll, like we'll be in the supermarket and we'll see something and I'll say, you know, well, what do you think about, you know, the way that, you know, that little kid was behaving, the way their mom addressed them or what happened there? What would you do? Just just so I can kind of have an idea of what's going on inside of my kids' heads. And they that really helps me better understand who my kids are by asking questions. So that helps a lot too. I love that. That is, that is so good. And I love, I love asking again, months later, maybe the same question. And when they've changed their mind, kind of figuring out why. And, and also that teaches them like critical thinking, like I, it's okay that I wanted to do this three months ago and it's okay that I've changed my mind and I'm moving in this direction now. Right. Because when you when I think about it, and I, I bet you could say the same thing. If you think about what you wanted to do at age 12. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely for me. It's not what I'm doing um, a lot of the times right now. So that that helps. And the other thing that I, I do is I join in the activities that they like to do, even if it's something that I don't like. If my kids like it, I try to make it a point to learn more about it, even if I'm not skilled skilled enough to participate. Like I, I've learned how to play um, a few video games with my kids. That there's a few new games that they're into right now. So they were downstairs playing the other day, and some of these things didn't make sense to me. So mm-hmm. I, you know, here I come. They're like, I know mom is coming, and she's going to have some questions. <laughs> but <laughs> I sat down and I said, Well, what's going on with this? Why do you? Why does this person have to be over here. And why does this happen? And they explain to me. So the next time, you know, they'll say to me, they'll say, well, mom, do you think you want to play now? So that's, you know, that's me joining in with the things that they like to do. My oldest is an avid football fan and has been since she was little. And so she's gotten to the place now where her knowledge of football has well surpassed mine. I like football, but she she can she and her father can hold lengthy conversations and I kind of just sit on on the side, you know, and when there's something I can jump in on, I will. But now when we're watching football games together, I'll ask her, I'll say, well, hey, what what happened there? I didn't quite understand that call. And she'll explain it to me. It's something that she likes. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't take anything out of my time to be able to do it. And it's just those things that help us to bond with our kids. You know, they they they, you know, kids are into dances and things like this. So, you know, sometimes I try to hang and my kids are like, (laughs) My kids are like, nah, mom, you need to stop that. That's not, <laughs> that's not quite that's not quite how it goes. But even when they say that, mom, you look silly and all that, that's relationship building. You know, our kids are going to remember those times that we took to actually physically be with them. Yes, I am a big fan of a dance party in the kitchen. That is <laughs> That happens on the regular. The only thing about it is, is I usually have our music on that my husband and I like. We we have always from the start tried to just play like music we like, even when they were really little, so that we weren't 
constantly surrendering to listening to kids music 24 7 uh but these kids man they like all these songs about food about pancakes and tacos and <laughs> so every night i think i know i think i know the taco song that you're referencing <laughs> it's well if your daughter's nine so she's like the age of my oldest so it's yep. like, it's raining tacos by perry yes, Grip. no need to ask why yep. <laughs> So I find myself dancing to breakfast burrito and it's raining tacos in the kitchen <laughs> quite often. Uh, you know, you mentioned your oldest being 16 and, you know, feeling like, oh, it was just yesterday that we we pulled into the driveway in the minivan or whatever, bringing her home from the hospital. And I, I am at this point, and I, I think we're always kind of like, trying to grasp okay all that time has already passed I can't go back and relive any of it here we are now um but I I mean I see it flashing my kids are two through eight um mm -hmm. two four two four six eight or I don't even what yeah yeah two yeah Russ is about to turn four so <laughs> been there yeah two four six eight and you know even though I'm in the trenches right I still have a two-year-old I'm still like make it freeze, you know, make it stop. And I'm trying really hard to reconcile this and live right now and not be sad that every what of what's already passed and not be fearful of like, it's going to be gone in a hot second. And so I wonder how you process that in your mind. Cause I feel like as moms, we're constantly in that feeling like, ah, oh, it's going to be here and gone, you know, it, it does. It goes by really quickly. I remember sitting on the couch after my after we brought my oldest home from the hospital and my mom was there with me and I was nursing and it was just one of those early days of nursing where you're trying to get used to it and it's it's rough it and I said to my mom I said I feel like I'm going to be sitting on this couch nursing for the rest of my life and my mom said no nope, you won't she said believe me you're going to blink and it's going to go past very quickly and I didn't believe her not because I thought my mom was lying, but because of just the the pressures of that moment. And mm. that was all I could think about. But it has gone by really quickly. And I'm at the place where now she's got this school year and next school year coming up. And she could be off on a college campus someplace. And I'm trying to wrap my brain around the fact that I I may not be able to see her every day. I might not be able to talk to her every day. And that's hard. You know, if you think about it long enough, you know, you, you may want to run and get a tissue. But at the same time, I think the thing that that gets me through that is thinking about all the good things that we have poured into her and just knowing that we have equipped her and knowing that this this time is passing. But I have so many more things to look forward to. You know, what is she going to major in? Uh, what kind of job is she going to get? you know, helping her with all the first that come, you know, the first car moving into that first place and all of those things. So I try to, I try to not to so much dwell on what it is that's passing as much as thinking, this is going to be cool. Some new things are going to be coming up. I'm going to, I'm moving into a new phase of mothering. So I don't want to, I don't want to mourn what has has passed. I want to appreciate that, certainly. But I'm also looking forward to the things that are, are going to be happening in the future. And that's what that's what gives me hope and makes me happy. That is beautiful. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> what What's your favorite thing about parenting teens? My favorite thing about parenting teens. I love how my teens are pretty honest. Mm -hmm. You know, they're respectful, but they're honest. And you never know what what kind of response you're going to get from them. <laughs> mm. You know, you'll ask a question and you'll think, oh, you know, I know this kid. Well, she's going to say this, but she doesn't. And it's because they're growing and they're changing and they're becoming their own person. And that's you know, that's what I like. I like seeing that mix of what my husband and I have poured into her over the years. But I also like seeing her taking what we've poured in and making it her own and putting her own spin on it so that she's her own person. Okay, I'm going to ask you a real honest question about teen girls. How, mm -hmm. how do you handle, how did you handle and how do you plan to handle talking about hormones and, and body changes and things like that? 
Well, (laughs) way back when we sat down with the older two and just had the talk because I knew that I could see changes happening in my oldest already. And I said, you know, my husband and I were saying, you know what, we need to really get ahead of the curve Mm -hmm. on this one because we don't want her um, to be surprised. And we didn't want her to be afraid about what was happening. And we didn't want her to think that she was weird or anything like that. And so we sat down with the book um, because none of us, you know, neither we're brave, but we weren't brave enough to wing that conversation. <laughs> so, so we sat down with a book and we went through everything and talked. And for the most part, my husband, you know, he lets his girls know that he's there for them. But a lot of that falls um, to me mm-hmm. because I'm the one who understands it better and experiences it better. And I encourage them just to... um be honest about how you're feeling. If, you know, if you're having one of those kind of days and you're feeling a little cranky, you know, it's okay to say, you know what, mom, I'm not, I can't, I can't deal with this right now just because. And when I hear the just because, just because is a loaded phrase. I know what just because means. That's Mm. because the hormones are acting up and all of that type of stuff. And I've taught my other girls and my husband, you know, I'm just saying, look, these are the kind of things we need to be looking out for. When someone, when one of the girls is behaving this way, it probably is a hormonal thing. And just knowing um, that that's what happens. And we've all just talked about trying not to take things personally because there have been times where, you know, I've had a discussion with one of my teens in the kitchen and they'll have to go upstairs. We're having a happy conversation in the kitchen. We're laughing, having a good time. And then she'll have to go upstairs and get something and be upstairs for a few minutes. And then when she comes down, it's like a different person mm. has come down. And I'm still in the happy, haha laughter <laughs> conversation that we were having before. I didn't get the memo that, you know, there was like a <laughs> hormone wave or something that happened upstairs unbeknownst <laughs> to me. So now, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pivot and, you know, adjust and fix. So, you you know, my grandmother used to always tell us, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. Mm. And that is something that I'm holding on to because we just have to be really flexible. And again, that goes back to the whole asking questions thing. When they when they're having those times, the one thing I've learned that kind of helps um, diffuse things is not what's wrong with you. Mm. I've learned that that's, that's never, <laughs> never the right way to begin. But I always say, is there something I can help you with? And that kind of opens the door to lots of things. If you don't want to talk about it, then you don't have to talk about it. But if there's something I can do to help you get through this, I can do that. You know, maybe I need to bring you, you know, a cup of tea. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you just need to know that your sisters aren't going to bother you while you have 30 minutes in your room alone. So I find that just, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? And sometimes, honestly, Lindsay, they don't know because Mm -hmm. hormones are crazy. And I let them know, you know what? It's okay not to know. And I understand that. But I also let them know that it's it's okay not to know, but it's not okay to just flip out on other people. Mm -hmm. You know, there there has to be there has to be that type of balance, because I, I tell them, look, at any given point in time, there are women that you pass in the supermarket, you know, on the highway you know, who are dealing with hormonal issues too. We all can't just wig out. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's, that's not going to be a good thing for any of us. But so we have to learn how to, you know, talk about what it is that we need. And then we have to learn how to exercise some self-control. And it's not a word that my kids want to hear. And honestly, Lindsay, it's not a word that I want to hear, but we just have to learn how to I don't say self-control in the fact that you can't express yourself, but you have to learn how to have enough control to express yourself in a way that's going to allow you to get the help you need, but also be respectful to the other people in your household. Yeah, I have caught myself and I get so, you know, when you say something and you're like, I should not have said that to my kid. We've all done it. Mm -hmm. Um, When I, when my usually it's my oldest is freaking out about something. And I say, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, ah, the second it pours out of my mouth, I'm like, why did you say that? That is just like, not a helpful (laughs) thing to say. And, and then I think about it. If someone said, what is wrong with you to me, how it would make me feel, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how I've been trying to restructure how I say things. How would you feel if someone said that to you, to you, you might be the authority figure here, but like, you still need to think about how you would feel if someone said that. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like growing up, I don't know if it was just 
you know, how my own parents, maybe a lack of education of teaching us about the hormonal thing, but like, I feel like I was really into my thirties before I got a grip on the fact that like, man, the hormone changes that you go throughout the month really affect the way you feel and, and your anxiety levels and things like that. And so talking to your kids about that, you know, so that they know, Hey, heads up. Like if, if your period's coming next week, you might have, you might be feeling kind of different the week before. It's just so important. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things too, where it would be different if you knew that every third Monday at five o'clock, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. But a lot, a lot of, you know, girls aren't regular like that. And it's, I think sometimes because their cycles aren't always regular, sometimes they get caught off guard Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'll come to them privately and say, Hey, you know, you seem, you seem to be struggling here. Um, you know, let, let's look at the calendar. Let's see. And then they'll say, Oh, this is what's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think it was that time because last month, you know, it just, it's learning to just kind of work with them and help them through so that they don't feel like they're crazy. Because I've had, you know, one child come to me and say, I feel like I'm losing my mind right now, mom. Mm -hmm. These hormones are crazy. And I'll always say, I understand. I'm so sorry. What can I do to help? And then, you know, we kind of go through it together, but it's, it's good for them to know that this is, this is just natural. You know, you're not going to be, you're not going to feel sunshine and rainbows all the time. And it's okay. This is, this is a natural thing, but that's why it's good for us to be honest with them and say, look, I understand how you feel. Yeah. Let us go. Let's go open, you know, let's go outside and, you know, open up the garage, take some bikes and, you know, ride out for a minute or take a walk and see if we can, you know, get ourselves together. And that's, that's how we do it. Yeah, it's so it's so uh, true too. Even as an adult, you you almost feel a sigh of relief when you realize, oh, that's it. That's what it mm-hmm. is. <laughs> I'm not crazy. It's hormones. Yes. Oh, for sure. Um, well, I feel like I could really learn a lot from you. I can you just be my mentor? <laughs> <laughs> You can call me anytime. I'm oh. not perfect. I'm praying every single day and just, you know, doing what what I feel needs to be done for, you know, for my girls because I just want I want the best for them. And I want not material things for them. Um I don't necessarily want you know, their lives to be a bed of roses either, you know, some, some adversity can, you know, make you stronger, but I, I want to prepare them and I want the memories that they have of me as their mom to be good ones. I always want them to be able to go back and think about good times that they had with me and encouraging times because those are the kind of moms I want them to be for my grandkids. Yeah. I was going to say one of the questions, um, I was going to ask my mom this and I was going to ask my father-in-law this to kind of like tease the beginning of this podcast. What's something that you have made sure to teach your children that you hope your kids will teach their children? The thing that I've learned is not to be afraid to apologize when you mess up. And that's a hard thing as a parent. You know, you were mentioning earlier just about being that authority figure. And as a parent, you are. But there are times when you make mistakes and Mm -hmm. I make mistakes. And, you know, we've talked about saying things that you should not have said. And it made me think of uh, this one time a few years ago. My husband and I were heading off to um, I think we were going to a retreat and a relative had said that they would take um, the kids. And so I got them, you know, got them straightened out and, you know, two of them hopped out and my, um, oldest, you know, I don't know, we were just having a rough time that day. And I, I, I was rushing. That's what it was. I was rushing and I snapped at her and, you know, sent her off into my, you know, to stay with my brother and sister-in-law and went on my way. But as soon as I turned the corner, I just felt, you know what, you know, you were incorrect in the way you spoke to her you weren't kind, you need to pick up the phone and you need to call her right now and tell her that you're sorry. And I remember thinking, but she was, she was doing this and that. And I asked her to get this and she didn't. And this was the reason. And I just felt just pick up the phone and call her and tell her that you're sorry. And I did. 
And to this day, she accepted my apology, but to this day, it's one of those things that really has stuck with her. She's, you know, I remember that day that you called me and you told me that you were sorry for the way you treated me and you asked me to forgive you. And I think that's, that's what I want my kids to be able to do because they're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. And when you do own, own, own your mess ups, Mm -hmm. you know, be, I, I tell my kids, you know, be as loud in your apology as you were in that point when you were doing something wrong, make your apology count. And it's one of those things where it's hard for people in this day and age to apologize. Everyone, um, is saving face. Everyone, you know, not everyone, but some don't want to admit that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And we do make mistakes. And it's important for you to be able to say, you know what, I messed up. And I'm sorry. That's what I want. I want my kids to be able to do that and be comfortable with it. That's I love that point. Be comfortable with it. I know anytime when something happens, and they want to just run from what happened. Life is going to be so much more peaceful for you if you can own up to it and apologize yeah. and move on. And you probably had a much better weekend on that trip knowing that you oh, made I that did. call. I did. And she, you know, instead of her feeling bad for that whole entire weekend and thinking, oh, what's it going to be like when mom gets mm-hmm. back? Is she still going to be mad? With uncertainty hanging over her, that apology just, you know, it fixed everything. It just, it made things better. Wow. Okay, Andrea, what's one thing professionally or personally that you'd like to do in your life that you haven't done yet? (laughs) Now, are you going to laugh? No, maybe. (laughs) I love your honesty. (laughs) I have always wanted to have a bed and breakfast. I like to, I like to do, um, decorating. You know, I'm, I'm certainly far from Joanna Gaines or, you know, anything on, you know, HGTV, but I do, Uh, like to make my home comfortable. And I think the idea of just having a small bed and breakfast where maybe a couple people can come to kind of uh, refresh over a weekend or something like that, where I could, you know, decorate, you know, a nice bedroom suite or something for them and pick out, pick out comfy pillows and nice bedding and things like that would be fun. And then to just be able to make some some comfortable, um, comforting, but elegant little meals for people. So waking up and having like a special breakfast and then, um, you know, having, you know, just some snacks out throughout the day. I would love to just have a quaint little bed and breakfast one day. Do you think it's something that you, you will, will you'll go for like once your kids are out of the house? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It, it depends on where I am in yeah. my life at that point. And, you know, it, it, it just, it's something that's inside of my head and something that's, mm-hmm. you know, interesting. You know, I like to run stuff past my husband when I have these thoughts and say, Hey, what do you think about this? So, you know, if he's, if he's on board, then, you know, after the kids are gone, then, then that might make it a little bit easier if he wants to be, you know, the sous chef uh, <laughs> while I uh, get things together. But it, it would be neat. I, I think, I think I would be good at it. Yeah, I think you would be too. It sounds really, it sounds really like I want to come, I want to come to the bed and breakfast. You'll be the first to know. (laughs) What is the best, most recent book you've read? I just finished reading Jackie Robinson's autobiography. It's called, I Never Had It Made. And I read it because I have been interested in Jackie Robinson for a long time. And I am going to go through his story with a group of high schoolers this year. So I said, let me just sit down and read it. And it it's it was an amazing book. It was just it was an amazing book just to to hear from Jackie Robinson himself about what it meant to be the one who broke the color barrier in baseball and to just get background information about uh, the struggles that he went through personally, uh, to read about how his wife was such a wonderful support to him, and then to just read about some sad things that happened in his life, um, loss of children and mm. uh, failing health in, in his later years. So it's been a wonderful book. I just finished it two weeks ago. Oh, wow. That does sound really good. Okay. Add that to your list, everybody. That sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, what Do you have any books for kids or young adults that your girls really like? 
I asked my girls, and this is interesting, as a mom, you always have that idea, I know what they're going to say, and then you ask them and they say something different. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. I, I had a couple books that I thought for sure that they were going to say, but my girls, um, one of my girls' favorite books is called The Little Prince, and I cannot right now remember the author of The Little Prince. It's an old book and the author is French, but it's one of those books where you can read it to littles, like you'd be able to read it to your eight or nine year old and they would just see an adventurous story of a little prince who lands on another planet and the friendship that he makes there on the planet. But it's the same book that you can read as a teenager or a young adult and recognize, hey, this story about this is really a story about friendship. It's really a story um, about loneliness and it's about the complexity of friendship and it's about the beauty of childhood. So that's that's a book that they really enjoy. Okay. And the last question we have today is what message do you want to leave our audience with? Mm, so many messages. But the, the one thing I'm just encouraged to say now is just to love the people that you've been blessed to have in your life. Their life is short. It goes by really, really quickly. And just being able to love the ones you're with and enjoy the current moment that you have with them. That's, that's what's important. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Andrea. You guys can learn more about Andrea's work with the African-American homeschool moms when you just go to africanamericanhomeschoolmoms.com. You can find her on Instagram, andrea.thorpe over there. Um, we would love to connect with you on social media. Why is everyone yelling on Instagram and Facebook? This is all part of the Sandy Boy Productions podcast network. So you can find us on social media there as well. I'm super grateful for each of you. We have some really great episodes coming up soon that I'm pumped to share with you all. So thank you for being here and have a really great rest of your day.